Welcome back to Exponential Functions with the Math Coach. In this episode, we will be taking a closer look into some word problems. By the end of this unit, you will be able to create exponential equations and apply them to real-world applications. I can't wait to get started. Taking a look at page 263, number 12 in your textbook, it says, A collector's hockey card is per just in 1990 for five dollars so let me just write that out so the value of the card okay at the beginning it is worth five dollars okay so that's what i know now i'm putting time equals zero i'm putting time equals zero here because that's the beginning the time is zero that's the beginning of this problem now, obviously the year is not what's gonna be in the formula, but the year is actually 1990. So we have 1990 there. Now it says every year, so every single year, the value of the card increases by 6%. Remember, if there was no increase, so we're trying to figure out what the common ratio will be. If there was no increase, then the common ratio would have to be 1 because you multiply by 1 and that's 5 again. And if you multiply by 1, it's 5 again. And if you multiply by 1. So when the common ratio is 1, you don't really have any increase or decrease. It just remains the same number. If you are increasing, so if we're increasing the common ratio by six percent we know that six percent as a number is 0 0.06 so if we wanted to increase these numbers every year by six percent remember the common ratio being one means there is no increase if we're adding or increasing by six percent per year that would actually make the common ratio 1.06 if we are increasing by a certain percentage we add it to 1 if we are decreasing by a certain percentage we subtract that percentage from 1 now you could fill in the rest of these numbers here if you wish but there's no need to because you have enough information in order to come up with a formula for this situation however we could always do 5 times 1.06 and you would get 5.30 so after the first year it's going to be worth five dollars and thirty cents and if you multiply by a 1.06 again then you're going to get five dollars and sixty if we round correctly sixty two cents although it says 0.618 is the more accurate number this is a rounded answer. However, it asks us to come up with a formula for this, an equation that models the value of the card given the number of years since the beginning. We know the beginning is 1990. So time zero, just remember, refers to the year 1990. Now, to come up with the formula of this is pretty simple. The value of the card is going to be equal to Remember, the first number you always write, the first number you always write, your A value, is always going to be the initial value of the card. And we know that the initial value of the card is $5. So we write a 5 here. Then in brackets, always goes our base. Once again, we know what our base is. Our base is just whatever the common ratio is. And we know that the common ratio is one point. 0, 06 so that's what goes in here and then it's to the exponent time over and let's see how often this occurs it occurs per year so it's every one year this thing increases so it's over one 
okay? Clearly, we're not gonna write the over one, we can erase that, but just so you know, that is over one. So now this is the value of the card for any given time. If it asks us to figure out any year, um, we can figure out what the value of the card is during any year. So I'll let you finish the rest of that. Question 16 on page 263 is a communication question. It says a group of yeast cells grows by 75% every three hours. So we have time occurring and we have the population, let's say, of yeast cells. And again, it says it grows by 75% every three hours. So it also tells us at 9 a.m., so the start time, there are 200 yeast cells. So at the initial time, there are 200 yeast cells. And it's saying that the time on the clock, though, so the actual clock time is 9 a.m. But that's not for the formula. The formula is time zero. So it says that it increases by 75% every three hours. So this is occurring every three hours. So every third hour, something occurs. Three hours after that, something happens. And three hours after that, something happens again. There's this increase. Remember, if there is no increase whatsoever, the common ratio is going to be just one, meaning there is no increase or decrease. If you multiply 200 by one, you would end up with 200 again. But that's not the case. Obviously, this is not even an exponential function if the common ratio is one. It says that there's an increase and the increase is by 75%. So we have to increase this number over here, this one, by 75%. Remember, 75% as a decimal, dividing by 100, 75% is written as 0 0.75. So if we take a look at this, um, if we increase this number by 75%, we're adding 75% to this, that is what the common ratio should be, 1.75. Now, we don't actually have to figure out what the next number is here after three hours, but you could. Now, it asks us to write an equation that models the number of cells given the number of hours after 9 a.m. So, no problem, the population of these cells is going to be equal to, remember the first number is always the initial value, which is 200, then what's the base of this thing? Well, the base is always the common ratio. The base is always the common ratio, in this case, the common ratio is 1.75. And what should the exponent be? Well, we have to take a look at this x-axis because the exponent should not just be to the power of t. It should be t over 3 because it is happening per 3 hours. That common ratio right here is happening every 3 hours to that initial 200. So this is the formula for that population. It says explain how each part of your equation is related to the given information. Well, we know that 200 is the initial Okay, we know that the common ratio is 1.75 because there is a growth, so we add 75% to 1. And then we know that this growth is happening per or every 3 hours. So this would be explaining everything in this formula. Obviously, this is population as a function of time, and this is the time in hours. Question number 15 from page 263 is a thinking problem. And so if we read this out, it says, a town has a population of 8,400 in 1990. Okay, so we do have some information right away. We have population, okay, so at time zero, I mean the year that they're giving us is 1990. So that's okay, we can write 1990 as the year but it's still, that's the initial population, and it's telling me that the initial population of this town is 8,400. That's the first sentence. It says then, 15 years later, its population grew to 12,500. So 15 years later, 
its population is 12,500. I mean, they didn't give you the year number, but they could have. 15 years later would be the year 2005. Not that that means anything, but that's what they could have given you. So they're giving you these two pieces of information and they're telling you that it is an exponential function because they're asking us to determine the average annual growth rate. So what is the average annual growth rate? This is what we're trying to figure out, the growth rate. Okay, so we are trying to figure out what the common ratio is. What is the common ratio? Because we want to know after one year, what is the new population? So what is the growth rate? Okay, now coming up with the formula for this, we can come up with a formula for this, no problem. Uh, the formula for this, from what we know, we know that population is equal to, and now we have this information, 8,400 always goes there, the initial population, then the base. Well, the base is the common ratio, right? The base is always this number right here. We don't know that number. That's actually what we're trying to find out. So I'm going to write B for base. And then it's to the power of time over one, because we know that it's asking us annually or every year, what is the growth rate? So we're trying to figure out per year what the growth rate is. So it's happening per year. So this is the formula. Now, we can use this formula to plug in this piece of information that we have here. See, we have another piece of information. We know that when the population is 12,500, we know that the that the time that this occurs is at 15 years later. So now we have enough information in order to figure out what my B is, what my base is. So continuing this, the first thing I'm gonna do actually is divide out the 8,400 from both sides. So I take both sides and divide by 8,400 and I will get that base to the power of 15 is equal to now, this is not a nice number, but I can reduce this by a few zeros, a couple of zeros. So 125 over 84. Okay, so that's equal to this fraction. Now it's a fraction that goes on forever, so I'll just leave it like that. Now, how do I get rid of the exponent 15? Now, I don't need to bring logs into this situation, okay? I do not need to bring in logs because logs is when we're trying to find the exponent. We're not trying to find the exponent here. Remember, if you ever had something like this, b squared equals nine, I mean, to get rid of the square, you take the square root of both sides. Likewise, um, if you had b cubed equals 27, let's say, you would take the cubed root of both sides here okay now this is not cubed so obviously it's to the power of 15 so we could still get rid of that to the power of 15 by doing the opposite operation which is actually to take the cubed root oh, sorry the 15th root of both sides if i take the 15th root of both sides that gets rid of this so i'll be left with b is equal to now, be careful when you take the 15th root of this thing because it's of the entire thing. So I would first figure out what 125 divided by 84 is first, and then I would take the 15th root of that number. And I get the answer of 1.02685, and this number goes on for a long while. So. If I took this and only had and only kept a few of the decimal places, let's say 1.027, I would say the base we have here is 1.027. Okay, so we figured out the base. We're almost done with the problem. Remember how much increase, okay, so what is the increase? What is the increase? Remember that the number one, okay, doesn't count for anything. One, if the common ratio is one, it doesn't increase or decrease. So how much more than one is this number? And this is how much more than one it is. 
So that 0 0.027 is the increase. So we have to figure this out as a percentage. So if we multiply that by 100, we're going to get that this is equal to 2.7% of an increase. And that's the final answer. We interrupt this program to bring you... All right, let's take a look at yesterday's high school teacher draft from Radio City Music Hall, where Central Rapids High, recipient of the worst test scores last semester, made the first pick. That was no surprise to anyone. For the first pick, Central Rapids High takes... Calculus teacher Mike Yost from Tulsa Teachers College. And just like that, you're a millionaire. <laughs> So let's take a look at some of the problems the review. Number 15 says the value of a car after it is purchased depreciates according to this formula. V at N is the car's value in the nth year since it was purchased. Now it asks us to describe a bunch of things about this car, about this vehicle. I mean, without it even asking me anything, we should always understand that this value is the initial. This is the initial value of the vehicle, $28,000. That's what it was purchased for in year zero, okay? And if you wanted to come up with a table of values for this, you can do so. Um, I would have my X's be N and my Y's be V at N. And of course, at year zero, the car's value is $28,000. Now, we know that the common ratio is whatever the base is. This is the common ratio. And so, if I wanted to uh, write the common ratio over here, I have that the common ratio is 0 0.875. So in order to get to the next number, I would multiply by 87.5%, 0.875. I know that this 0 0.875 is affecting this value per year because this is N over 1. So that, that decrease is happening every year. So these would go up by increments of 1. We could figure out these numbers just by simply multiplying 28,000 times this 0 0.875 if we needed that. Now we've already answered question A because question A asks us what's the initial value of the vehicle. Question B asks us what is the annual rate of depreciation? Well, the depreciation rate, remember, how much is this depreciating by? Okay, well, if there is no depreciation or appreciation, if it's not growing or decaying, the common ratio would be 1. But that's this number is less than 1. So we'll figure out how much less than 1 it really is. So if I take the difference, I'm going to end up with 0 0.125. That is the amount of decrease from 1. If we write that as a percentage, that's 12.5%. So it's a 12.5% lower than 1. That is, the depreciation rate is not 87.5%. It's 12.5 because it's 12.5% less than 1. Question C asks us, what is the car's value at the end of 3 years? Well, all we have to do here is plug in a 3 into this formula. And if I plug in a 3 into this formula, I'm going to get 0 0.875 to the power of 3. And then multiplied by 28,000. And of course, we're going to round this to the nearest two decimal places because this is money. So we're going to round to the nearest penny. Now, remember to take care of this stuff first. You cannot multiply the 28,000 in there. You have to do the exponent first. 
So I did 0 0.875 to the power of 3, and then I multiply it by 28,000, and I end up with $18,757.81 when I round this correctly. That's how much it's worth after the end of third year. The question then asks us for uh, D, what is the value uh, of the car after 30 months, okay? Please do not plug in 30 into that formula because the formula is in years. This formula is in years, not months, okay? So if we want to plug that, plug 30 months in, we're gonna first have to divide this by 12 because we know there's 12 months in a year. And if we do that, we end up with 2.5 years, okay? So what you should be plugging into the formula is actually 2.5. I'll let you finish that question off on your own, but that's what you would plug in for the exponent. And I'd actually like to ask you my own question. I wanna ask you when Okay, so what year will the value of the car be worth $10,000? Okay, so when will this thing be worth $10,000? This question is not in your textbook, but I just wanted to answer it just in case there was an assignment or a quiz or test and it asks you to figure out what year this would be $10,000. So how would you go about doing this? Well, you'd be plugging in 10,000 in for the value, and then you leave everything else the same. So this is 28,000, and this is 0 0.875 to the power of n. So one thing you could do right now to try to isolate for n, first off, you can, multi you can divide out the 28,000 from both sides. So that's actually what I'm gonna do. I'll divide out both the 28,000 from both sides. On this side, I'm left with 0 0.875 to the power of n. And on this side, I'm left with not such a nice number. But what I can do is I can actually divide out, uh, reduce this fraction to 10 over 28. Actually, I can reduce that more because both top and bottom are divisible by 2. So it's the same as 5 over 14. Okay, so I'll leave it like that because this is not a nice number. It goes on forever. And remember, um, how do I solve something that looks like this? Remember, if you are solving, you are solving for the exponent, you must use logs in order to do this. Okay, otherwise you're going to be playing around with your calculator for a long time, especially if it wanted to know how many years and months Maybe it wants even days. But let's figure this years and months. How many years and months later? Um, so how do I do this using logs? Quite simple. First off, logs get rid of the exponents. So I will take the log of both sides. I'm allowed to do the exact same thing to both sides. So if I take the log of both sides, remember the one and only log rule that you were asked to memorize because you don't know y right now but you do know it is a rule and so the only log rule i'm asked to memorize in a situation like this this is the exact same as writing n times the log of 0 0.875 and that's in my last video i discuss logs in which case now this is n multiplied by this stuff so if i wanted n alone on this side I would bring this all over to the other side by doing division because it's multiplication. So this is going to be log of 5 over 14 divided by log of this 0 0.875. And if you do this correctly, you're going to get n equals, and I'm going to do log, be sure to do the log of this entire 5 over 14. So for me, I have to press the log button second. So I would actually do 5 divided by 14, figure out what that is, take the log of it, and then I would divide by the 
uh, log of 0 0.875. So you have to figure out how your calculator works. And then um, you should end up with this answer though, 7.7, .7, roughly around there. And so it's 7.7 .7 years later. I mean, we know it's seven years. So, I mean, if it, the question asks us to round to the nearest year, you're going to round to eight years. But if it asks us to round to the nearest month, I know it's seven whole years right there. But I am going to convert this decimal, this 0 0.7, back to months. And how do I do that? I multiply by 12 because there are 12 months in a year. And I get 8.4 months. So I will round this to seven years and eight months, okay? I mean, the point 0.4, we can round it to days or whatever it is, but this is what I'm gonna round it to, to the nearest month. So it will be roughly seven years and eight months later. I mean, we could double check our answer. I mean, this is a rounded answer, but we could double check this answer because we could technically plug in a 7.7 .7 into the formula if we plugged a 7.7 .7 into this formula we better get something around the number 10,000 again this is a rounded answer but if you did this you should get 10,000 as your answer or something very close to 10,000 so taking a look at question 17 question 17 talks about a population of a city as time goes on so you have time and you have population of a city. It says the population of a city is growing at an average rate of 3% per year. In 1990, the population was 45,000. So it's telling you that the initial population, time zero, the initial population is 45,000. Now the actual year though, the calendar year, is the year 1990 okay but that is not the time that you're going to plug into the formula the beginning time is always time zero and the initial time there's 45,000 people it also says that the common ratio remember if there is no growth the common ratio would just be one okay now that doesn't make sense it wouldn't be exponential but if you multiply 45,000 by one, it would just be 45,000 again. That is indicating no growth. But it is growing. Remember, if it's decreasing in value, you subtract it from one. But if it's increasing in value, it says the city is growing at an average rate of 3% each year. So I'm going to add 3%. Remember that 3% is just 0.03. So if I add 3% to the 1, I get 1.03. This will give me a growth. Remember, as soon as, as soon as this is greater, if the base is greater than 1, that is a growth. If the, that's why we're adding the 3%. If it was decreasing by 3%, we'd subtract from the 1. Remember, if the base is less than 1, then it is a decay or a decreasing function. And now, remember, it also says that this growth is happening every year. So these are going up by increments of just every one year per year. So the equation of this, it says write an equation to model this growth and explain each part. This shouldn't be a big deal. Um, we have population as a function of time is equal to. We're always going to put the initial number first, which is 45,000. The base or the common ratio is 0 0.03 and it's to the power of t over 1 because this decrease or sorry, this increase is happening per year. But I'm not going to write that over 1. We should just understand that it's over 1. Okay, so that's the formula. So this explanation would just be that this 45,000 is the initial. Okay. So this is the initial value or the initial population. This 1.03 is the common ratio, or if we had to explain the common ratio or base, it's one plus 3% because 
it is an increase of 3%. And this is time over one because it's per year that this is happening, per one unit per every year. Question B says use your equation to determine the population of the city in 2007. Now, of course, you shouldn't be plugging in the year 2007 into the formula because that's the actual calendar year. Remember that the year 1990 actually means the initial time. So T stands for time, but time is the number of years that pass since the beginning. And the beginning happens to be the year 1990. So 2007 happens to be 17 years later. So I'm not going to plug in 2007 into this formula. I'm going to be plugging in the year 17 because 17 years later, that is the calendar year of 2007. So if I plug this in, um, I just want to bring up a point here. Again, I'm going to take care of this 1.03 to the power of 17 first. And then I'm going to multiply it by the 45,000. So I actually get the population 17 years later is 142,146.6845. Okay, uh, what should we round this to? Well, we're going to round this to the nearest whole number. But the correct way, I'm not sure what the back of the book says, but the correct way of rounding this is actually to 142,146. I realize that this number is a six, but no, we can't, um, I guess, round up a person, if that makes any sense. It's 0.6 of a person. There's no such thing as 0.6 of a person. So right now, the number of whole people that are there I mean, this is an estimate anyways, uh, based on this graph and based on this growth rate. This is the estimate that I would go with. I wouldn't round that up. I'm not sure if your uh, book rounds that up, but the proper way of rounding bacteria, for instance, bacteria grows in a Petri dish. People do not. So if this was bacteria, after the 17th year, there would be this many whole bacteria the 0.6 is a bacteria still about to form, but has not formed. So this is why I would round the answer to 142,146 people. Now let's take a look at question 14 on the same page. It speaks about a hot cup of coffee cools according to the equation, all of this, where T, capital T is the temperature in degrees Celsius, and little t is the time in minutes. Um, which part of the equation indicates that this is an example of exponential decay? What was the initial temperature of the coffee? Let's start with that. So why is this exponential decay? Well, you can see that the base is less than 1. Okay, so we know when the base is less than 1, it is an example of decay. This is a lot different than, let's say, a population question. A population question that we've seen, we've seen a population question that looks like this, okay? And this population question, if I had you make up a word problem for this population question, I mean, this would should be pretty simple for you. You could speak about the population of a bacteria, okay? And you could say, initially, there are 500 bacteria. This is the initial, okay? And you can also say that this bacteria doubles. And you can also say that it doubles every five days, minutes, hours. Let's do hours. Doesn't matter. But that's basically what the word problem would look like for a formula that looked like this. The initial population of bacteria is 500. It doubles every five hours. And that's the formula for that type of scenario. Notice that there is no plus something at the very end. I mean, the temperature problems always have this plus something at the very end. This has plus zero at the very end. 
Remember that the initial I said at the beginning of my last video, initial is always A plus C. And in these population questions, there has never been a C out here, never. So you have to realize that the doubling that is occurring in a situation like this, this doubling always occurs to the 500 only. It's only applied to that 500 and it's applied every five hours. All right. That's very important because when we look at something like the temperature problem, there happens to be a C value out here, which messes everything up kind of, not really. But we should understand that this half is being applied to that 69. Now, 69 is not the initial temperature. I'll, figure, I'll show you how to figure out the initial temperature. It's always A plus C. So some of you could look at this and say it's 90. But you could also plug in time equals zero because we should understand that initial temperature, initial means at time zero. If we plugged in a zero into this formula, you could get 90 by doing this mathematically. But I'm just discussing the formula here. So this half is being applied to the 69 and is being applied to the 69 every 30, in this case, it is minutes. Every 30 minutes, that 69, only the 69 is being cut in half. And then you add 21. That's what this problem is more like. It's a lot different than these population problems. So let's get back to the start of this. So A asks us, why is this exponential decay? And it's exponential decay because the base is equal to a half. Okay, and we know that if the base is less than one, then it is decay. It's decreasing. All right. Question B asks us, what's the initial temperature? I mean, the initial temperature, we should know the initial is always whatever A is plus C. So when we do A plus C, it's 69 plus 21. And 69 plus 21 is 90. Sir, I don't remember that. Okay, well, if you didn't remember that, you could have simply plugged in T equals zero into the formula, and that will also give you the initial temperature because at time zero, that's what the, initially this cup of hot coffee is equal to in terms of degrees Celsius. So if I plugged in a zero for time, I would still end up with, I get time Temperature at time zero is equal to 69. And then I have a half to the power of zero divided by 30 is just zero plus 21. See, when you plug in a zero in for the exponent, you end up with 69 and then half to the power of zero is just one. So you end up with A plus C. So temperature at time equals zero is 80 degrees Celsius. So that's the initial. Question C says, use your knowledge of transformations to sketch the graph of this function. That's a good one. So the good thing is it's just a sketch. A sketch is much easier to do than a graph because a sketch, all you really need to know if you wanted to sketch this temperature problem in blue, you need to know what your initial temperature is, which we do, it's 90. Each one of these ticks I've made up go up by 10. So you know the initial temperature. You know it's decreasing. You also know what the horizontal asymptote is. At least you should because the horizontal asymptote is always the C value. And if we draw a dotted line at 21 degrees, we know based on what we know about transformations, we know that this cup of hot liquid is cooling in a room whose temperature is 21 degrees. We saw an example of this in the notes and in the other homework. So it's getting closer and closer and closer to Y equals 21 or temperature equals 21, but never touching. So it looks something like this, it gets closer and closer and closer. So we know that exponential functions go down quickly, very quickly at the beginning, and then start tapering off 
when it gets closer and closer and closer. That is a great sketch. The room temperature, okay, the room temperature has to be 21 because it can't get lower than whatever the room's temperature is. It's not going to go freezing or something. If the room is only 21 degrees, that's what it'll get closer to. And we have to know what the initial temperature is. And that is always the y-intercept. Okay? Now, if this problem actually asks me to graph this thing. Now, graphing is a lot different than just sketching. Sketching, all you need is the y-intercept. And you need to know what the horizontal asymptote is. But if you wanted to actually graph this using five points, that shouldn't be that big of an issue either. I mean, we already have our first point is 0, 090. Then what should I go up by in terms of time? Please don't go up by ones. I mean, we can see that this 30 here, and I said this in my other homework take up, I should probably be going up by increments of 30, especially if I don't have a calculator, okay? Because if I plug in 30 right now in for time, um, it's going to make that exponent 1. So I'm going to go up by increments of 30. Then I'll plug in 60. It'll make the exponent 2. I'll plug in 90. It'll make the exponent 3. I'll plug in 120. It'll make the exponent 4 and so forth. Those are whole numbers. So um, I'm going to go up by this because every 30 minutes, this half is being applied to that 69. And then I add the 21. So I could do that, you know, off to the side and figure out what every single one of these numbers are. That shouldn't be a, a big issue. But that's, that is what your X values should be going up by if it does ask you to graph this using actual points. I want to speak about question E and F very quickly. Okay, but question E and F speak about what happens if the coffee coffee cooled quicker than it did here. If it cools quicker than that blue exponential function, then it would be a lot steeper at first and cool way faster. Okay, so that's what the graph would look like if it cooled a lot faster. I mean, that means that uh, how does it cool off faster? I mean, there's a couple ways you can argue this. Now, the way the textbooks wants you to argue it is that instead of a half, um, it wants that to, I mean, depreciate a lot faster than just a half, okay? So if it was a third of its temperature, that would be decreasing a lot faster, or a quarter of its temperature would be de decreasing a lot faster than just a half. Um, however, somebody can argue that this is a lot colder as well, the room temperature. But it didn't say anything about changing the room temperature. I mean, it's in the same room. So we're going to not worry about the horizontal asymptote. We're going to worry about this number here. So for E, I would say that instead of a half, that thing would have to be something that would um, decrease this a lot quicker, which would be a third, a quarter, a fifth, a tenth, whatever it is um, that decreases a lot quicker than just 50%. Well, sadly, my time has come to an end. I'd like to take this time to give a big shout out to my crew at Explain Everything for providing such an amazing app. Hopefully this video was helpful to you. I'm the math coach saying, see you next time, and thanks for watching.